Hey there! Welcome to the Flute 360 Podcast. I'm Dr. Heidi K. Begay, and I'm a flutist, educator, coach, and podcaster. My God given mission is to serve you. I am passionate about guiding you, the modern day flutist, to discover your unique voice on and off the stage. The goal of this podcast is to help you thrive both as an artist and as a musicpreneur. Go ahead and grab some espresso, your favorite notepad, and let's get to it. Today's episode 185 is titled An Interview with Elizabeth Rom. Hey, Flute 360 er Today is a new day and a new year. Welcome back to the show and thank you, thank you for your year-long support. Making connections with you in 2021 and previously has been a complete joy for me. Thank you to those from across the world who have reached out and told me your music stories and your music journeys. I love hearing from you. I love connecting with you. And so let's continue to bridge the gap and make these relationships that much deeper. I'm always here for you. And I pray that your 2022 is bountiful. I pray that you have an abundance of health, joy, and love in your life. This is the last weekend to sign up and register to the Ultimate Music Business Summit. It's going down January 6th, 7th and 8th of 2022, and I've been putting it together alongside my two colleagues, Arthur Brewer and Dr. Garrett Hope. We have poured our blood, sweat, and tears into this event for the last six months because we want to serve you. We want to help you, and we want to give you the right tools in order to pivot to be your own music boss. Now, if you are already your own music boss, then even more power to you. We are literally going to be talking about everything that the modern day musicpreneur needs under his or her belt in order to thrive as a business owner. We are going to be talking with 36 presenters over the course of these three days, and they're going to give you the tips and the know-how when it comes to audio production, networking, collaborations, building your own musical residencies, how to build your own digital courses, and so much more. The basic ticket is only $17, and the VIP ticket is $137. Now, because you are a 360 listener, we are giving you a discount code of 25% off of both of these tickets. Use your code PIVOTNOW at musicsummit.biz to claim your 25% discount now. That $17 ticket now is only $12.75, and it is completely budget friendly. I will be presenting. My presentation is titled Building Relationships, Initiate, Cultivate, and Scale. I hope to see you there. Again, it's January 6th, 7th, and 8th, and I hope that UMBS brings you many blessings that I know it will for your music business in 2022 and beyond. See you soon. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Flute 360 podcast episode. This series being published in January of 2022 is a special treat for me. I get to dive into six wonderful conversations with six wonderful guests, and we are going to be highlighting their careers and how they have been a pivotal force within our music community. In addition, we are also going to be highlighting a wonderful festival that is going down February 2022 through YouTube. I met a great friend who is a composer and a cellist. His name is Ron Royer, and he and I got together and decided we wanted to co-organize a flute festival. And this flute festival is going to be highlighting amazing composers' works, flutists from across the world, and even better yet, not just any works, but works by women composers. So this is the inspiration behind this Flute 360 series. And without further ado, 
help me welcome my first guest, Elizabeth Rom, to the show. She is a prolific composer, an oboist, an educator, and I cannot wait to pick her brain. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, my goodness. The pleasure is all mine. <laughs> and as we were saying pre-recording, I love your magnetic energy. You are so warm and kind, and we are going to have a wonderful time together. I'm sure we will. <laughs> Great. So for those who may not know you, can you share a little bit about yourself? Well, actually, I started oboe when I was 11 years old because the band needed an oboe. I, I, I'm sure a lot of musicians out there started because their band needed whatever instrument they play. Before that, I had played piano, sort of. My mother is a, was a music educator, and she taught me piano. And uh, then I went to Eastman as an oboe major, and I got a job with my husband at the uh, Atlantic Symphony in Halifax, Nova Scotia. It was a lucky chance that there was a principal oboe and a principal trombone opening. He's a trombonist. We both got the jobs, so we played in an orchestra together. As the time went on, we had two children by the time we went up there, and then I had a third when I was up there, and uh, I just felt like I just couldn't continue. We did a lot of touring mm. with a family like that. I felt like babysitters were bringing the kids up, so I resigned, and he got a job teaching at the University of Virginia in Saskatchewan which worked out really well, as it turned out. They needed an oboe in the orchestra there. So I ended up playing in the Regina Symphony, which is quite a good orchestra. Mm -hmm. It's on my recordings uh, of my violin concerto, horn concerto, and violin and viola concerto called uh, Elizabeth Rom, the Concertos of Elizabeth Rom, Myth, Legend, Romance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so I, but when I went there, that left a big hole in my life because I had gone from being a full-time oboist to the Regina Symphony's a part-time orchestra. Mm. So I, I, uh, I needed something else. Um, you had mentioned about women role models. Mm. And at that time, this is 1975, there were very few women in, as composers mm. that, that anyone ever heard of. Orchestras didn't play their music. Nobody really played their music. So I never thought of writing music, but I did think I could write words. So the uh, composition teacher and in Regina, his dream was to write songs. He wanted to go to Nashville. So we collaborated on what we called was Schutel and Rom hits. His name was Thomas Schutel, Dr. Thomas Schutel, and he would write music and I would write the words. We had them recorded. He took them to Nashville and they didn't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> so then we thought, OK, let's try an opera because that's more our field. So I wrote a libretto called The Final Bid about a bridge game. And it was perfect. S-A-T-B. Uh, you know, you have four players. Um, I gave him a libretto and a year went by and he didn't attempt to write the opera. And I said, well, when are you, what are you going to do? And he said, why don't you write it? I thought, me? Me? Write it? Compose? And, you know, I started, I thought I might as well give it a try. I took one of the arias and I started writing and it came quite easily. And I thought, is this all there is to composing as you write what you want to hear? Because somehow before that, I don't know what I knew, what I thought it was, but it seemed so utterly mysterious that it came from the heavens or came whatever and only to a select few. Mm -hmm. And then I found out, no, it's, it's just something... How do you phrase your music? You know, it's the same kind of thing. Yeah. You can try to teach someone how to phrase, you know, um, put, a, put a crescendo there, or do whatever, all the things that I'm sure you do with your flute students. Yeah. And some just do it. You don't have to tell them. Right. They just do it. And it's the same with the composing. You can teach a person how to compose. That, that's why Nadia Boulanger said you can't teach composition. She would teach theory, which is perhaps more important. That's why Bach uh is is the basis of so much theory and that's why many composers consider Bach the greatest composer because he knew how to put all these elements of music together into something that sounded wonderful so I 
That's how I started. I, I continued from that first aria and I wrote the whole opera. Uh, the University of Regina uh, produced it and CBC recorded it. And that was it. There was no looking back. I couldn't wait to start composing in the morning. You know, the kids would go off to school. My husband would go off to the university and I, I'd start composing. <laughs> and that's really how it all started. That's amazing. Are you kind of surprised by how it unfolded for you? Yes, I okay. am. I never, I never thought in my youth, although in my youth, I used to write things all the time. Okay. But I didn't take them seriously. Hmm. You, you know, because I, as I said, I didn't consider, I thought composers were all old dead men. <laughs> and and that's as far as it went with me. Yeah. But yes, I, I was quite surprised. You know, it's even a bigger surprise. Uh, in addition to writing for flute and operas and whatnot, my biggest uh, outlet is writing for tuba. Mm. I write a lot of music for tuba. <laughs> And that was because uh, we had a world-class tuba player in okay. Regina. Mm. He played all over the world. And when I, he came to my first opera, he was one of the few, I hate to say it, few, few of my friends that went to the first opera. And he loved it. And he started to pester me about writing for the tuba. Well, I never thought of, you know, I, I couldn't think what to do for the tuba. But then when I heard him play, it just, it was like a, a bass baritone, hmm. you know, it's a, a beautiful instrument yeah. all, but mostly what you hear is in the back of the orchestra, but hmm. no, he, he was a wonderful tuba player. And then CBC uh, asked for a commission and he said, why don't you write a tuba concerto, which I did. I wrote the legend of Heimdall and that also that was recorded as well. Hmm. So that that's kind of, and then, you know, there was no looking back. That's amazing. Going back to the little nugget you displayed earlier, you said that the music and composing, you thought that composition was just for the select few. Yeah. In our email correspondences, you said that the orchestra and being an oboist in an orchestra was your greatest teacher with yes. instrumentation. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, I'm an oboist. Yeah. So I have the strings in front of me. Mm the brass and percussion behind me, the woodwinds all around me. And I sit right next to the flute. So, and there is so much music that flute and oboe play in octaves quite often. I love that sound. I also like the switch, you know, have the oboe an octave higher and the flute low. It's a, it's a very, very interesting sound. Mm. Um, but that's, that's really, also my husband plays trombone. So I have a brass mentor. My daughter is a violinist. She's one of Canada's top violinists. So I have a string. My sister is also a violinist. Mm. Um, and my other daughter played percussion. Mm. So there you have it. <laughs> wow. It was right there in front of you. <laughs> yeah. And, and the other really helpful thing was that I played in a chamber ensemble, the Regina Symphony Chamber Players, which was a woodwind quintet, string quintet, and trumpet. And so I was able to, I would write something and I take like the clarinet part to the clarinet player and say, is this comfortable? Mm. And he would say, no, you're over the break too much or whatever. Mm. If, and I'd change it a little bit. And I say, how is that? Perfect. So I could get the same sound, but have it easy to play. And I was able to do that with all the instruments. And, you know, you, you reach a point where you kind of sense what is, is right or wrong, but I still always go to the musician and ask them. Yes, that's very smart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you want your music played. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So again, I'm just really fascinated by, you know, how you got into composing and your compositional career. So kind of going back to where it all began, you said you started composing around 1979? Yeah. Okay. So there were not a lot of female composers to mentor you during this yeah. time. So my curiosity is what would it have meant to you if you had a female composer as a mentor in your life during that time? I don't think it would have mattered at all. Okay. I, I, in fact, if anything, I feel like I was able to develop in my own way because there was oh. nobody. You know, it, it's, I think there's a lot of pressure 
for young composers to write in a certain style, a style that's uh, acceptable mm. by the granting agencies, uh, modern, avant-garde. Uh, it's almost that they almost feel like they're being heroic in writing that way. And I don't. I'm really a traditional writer. Huh. I much prefer that. I like the elements of avant-garde if it means something at that moment. Like I wrote uh, The Garden of Alice was uh, my second opera, mm. which, by the way, has just been uh, filmed by Pacific Opera of Victoria and uh, will be released soon. But I used a tone roll in that mm. uh, to designate the Queen of Hearts, who who is seems to be crazy, but she's in charge. You know, a tone roll is... Uh, in a way, it can be considered that way. But a lot of people would not recognize it as a tone roll. <laughs> I, I cheat a little bit. <laughs> I always want things to sound good. Okay, sure. And I'm sure that there are more elements to this question, but this piggybacks off nicely into my next question. And that is, what is your overarching mission as a composer? Get my music played and heard. Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. That's all. It, okay. It's also, you know, it's funny. Uh, it's also like some people like video games, you know, and you have to get to a certain uh, destination. You have to go through all these problems. I mm. sometimes think of composing as the same way. I, I need to get into that key because it's, you know, saxophones is the worst thing to write for because if everyone else is comfortable, they're in a horrible key. You know, mm -hmm. you have to be so careful about where you write. So I need to get into a key. How am I going to get there? What mm -hmm. kind of modulations am I going to use that are convincing? There's an awful lot of that. How can I, I'll get in a very vague notion of what I want. Now, mm -hmm. how can I execute that in a way that someone can play it? Mm -hmm. Again, it's a puzzle and I start mm -hmm. working on it and the next day, usually I'll write something. I say, I don't care. I'm going to write it. The next day I come back and I know what has to be changed, you know, because I had time to sleep on it and I know it has to be fixed. Mm. So it is, it's a little to me, it's like playing video games might be for someone else. I never played. I, I only played a little bit when the, my grandchildren were little and they okay. were very simple games. <laughs> that is so cool. I've never heard a composer correspond that to video games and that and using that analogy yeah, yeah yeah very neat so sitting in the orchestra as an oboist for many many years and you said you sat next to flutists right yes. yeah. as you compose for the flute how do you perceive the flute voice a soprano coloratura okay okay yeah yeah. No, the reason why I asked that is because some composers that I've interviewed in the past, they will say, oh, the flute voice, it should float. I hear it as a floating voice, you know, huh. and of course it depends on the style that you're composing in, correct? Yeah. But it's just interesting to hear how they perceive the flute and what they want to portray through that instrument based on the timbre. Yeah. So yeah. I didn't know if you had a specific idea in mind for, you know, that instrument no, just just flute because i you know i'm sitting next to flute players yeah. so yeah i don't want them to sound like anything other than flute one of my uh biggest influence for uh orchestration is brahms the way he okay. uses the flute and the oboe don't you think it, it's so mm. beautiful the flute yes. and the oboe together Ooh, i love that example yeah yeah I whenever i that. i when i play brahms i i just i, I feel so close to the flute player <laughs> <laughs> Nice. Beautiful. So kind of bringing everything back full circle to the beginning of this episode where I mentioned the SBO, the Scarborough Philharmonic oh, yeah. Orchestra, and their February 2022 festival. The co-host of this festival is Ron Royer, our mutual friend. Yeah. And so I'm curious, like, how did Ron come into your life? What is your relationship like? What is your association with the SBO? I played as an extra a couple times with the Scarborough Philharmonic Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And I also played uh, even more with his wife, Kay. She's a wonderful clarinet player. Mm -hmm. I've written several things for her. And I love her playing. 
And then one thing led to another. Ron asked me, Ron is an incredible person. He's such a generous person. Mm -hmm. You know, he always seems to want to help other people. Uh, He gets these ideas and then he, like he came to your conference and and he Mm -hmm. executes them. He he works on what he's going to do. And he has a competition every year for young emerging composers. And he asked me at one point if I would adjudicate the, the, and there were a lot of entries. And then you adjudicate and then you you mentor that mm-hmm. uh, one of the winners, maybe four or five winners. So that was the first thing. I've done that for several years. Then he asked me if I would be the composer in residence. This was um, 2020, 1920. Uh, mm-hmm. He asked me to be composer in residence. And that, unfortunately, is when the uh, COVID started. Mm-hmm. So that was a little difficult. I had written several things for his wife, okay, uh, with strings. Mm-hmm. She was playing with a string trio and clarinet. And she did, actually, you can go on YouTube and find one. It's called Searching for Sophia. Mm-hmm. You can see her playing with a string trio there. Uh, I wrote a, a piece um, when I was composing residence for Septet called Wascana Park. You can also go online and see that. And it's like a clarinet feature again. (laughs) Mm. But that is the main, how I um, met Ron. We also played a few jobs together. And um, I I don't have a car here in Toronto. I used to, when I was in Saskatchewan, it was fine. But I don't know, I got to Toronto and and you got the TTC. So I took a lot of trips with uh, Ron and Kay. Ron has so many stories. Yes, so he many does. Stories. Yeah. And so it, it was fascinating. So all of these things are, are the way I got to know Ron. He also uh, worked with the Olden String Quartet. They just released a quartet um, CD called Journey Through the Night. Mm. And uh, that's the music. I, my piece is on there, his music, all various composers. He brings these people together. Yeah. He's released several CDs. And mm. he he just seems to know everything. He has a background in Hollywood um, mm-hmm. recording, which he'll probably talk to you about later. But he's mm. his whole family was in uh, Los Angeles mm. uh, doing recordings and playing in the orchestras there. So, yeah. When I talk with Ron and as we have been co-organizing this festival, I look at him and I just, we can talk hours about his stories. And there have been hours where I just sit back and I listen. And afterwards, I'm like, man, I wish that was recorded. So that way I can digest it even more later, you know, just for my own personal use. Because his stories about Bartok and, you know, Berlioz and Wagner, it's, it's extraordinary. It is. Yeah, I've learned a lot from him. And he has an amazing memory. <laughs> he remembers everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. We need people like Ron in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of other compositions and new CDs coming out, you have uh, two new uh, latest works titled Northern Lights and The Bridal Veil Falls for yes. Flute. Yeah. Would you want to talk about those pieces? Well, that, that's another flute player. Jay Marsh is her name. And this has been a dream of hers for years mm-hmm. to make a flute CD. And she also is kind of loves nature. She has a cottage up north and she wanted something that expressed nature. Mm-hmm. So everyone on the CD has written something that, well, Northern Lights, that's nature. Mm-hmm. Northern Lights, I originally wrote for tape, for well, tape in the old days, mm-hmm. um, and flute. And uh, for Jane Schudel, Jane Schudel is the wife of Sh- the, the, the guy that I did Schudel and Rom hits with. <laughs> and I wrote my early, all my flute music for her. Mm. And so she, this was with tape and flute and mm. dancers. Mm. Then uh, when Jay was going to write, uh, make her CD, mm. uh, she asked me if I had something just for flute, because she had to do an audition tape. And I said, well, I have this. I I sent her the information. I sent her the recording. But she wanted harp. She wanted to do it with harp. Hmm. And she got a a, a harp player from the Toronto Symphony to play with her. So I had to rewrite the the tape part. I ended up doing it for flute, harp, and percussion. And it turned out really well. Hmm. She wants to take this on tour. 
Um, the other piece on the recording uh, was uh, since she she wanted something about the, the Algonquin area up north of Toronto. And so the Bridal Veil Falls are there. So I picked that and I picked scenes from the Bridal Veil Falls. Like one of the movements is called Porcupines. Mm. It's kind of uh, comical. <laughs> it's for flute, bassoon and harp. Okay. And once again, she wants to bring this uh, on tour in, yeah. in all these, these little towns up there. That, that's, that was her dream to do that. Yeah. So she's done it. She hasn't started the touring yet because we can't, but she's mm -hmm. made the CD. She just finished it. And I, I sent you the cover yeah. and, uh, and it, it's uh, once again, no looking back. Yeah, no, that's amazing. So as a follow-up question, I'm curious here, you're talking about collaborating with other like-minded musicians, yeah. right? And composing and having these musicians perform the piece um, on tours. And then what you mentioned earlier about one of Ron's strengths, bringing people together. Yeah. This is something that I have been voicing frequently throughout my show of saying, get yourself out there, bring people into your orbit, ask if so-and-so would be on said project because we cannot do it alone, right? Yeah. And as a composer, you know this, yes. <laughs> you need instruments to play For your sure. music. Yeah. <laughs> so if there is a musician right now listening to this and they're just like, oh, I have this idea. I'm too scared to, you know, bring those people into my orbit. I don't know how to network. I don't know how to go about collaborations. What is the main tip that you would advise to said person? Well, I'm not, what do they call it? Um, Social media. Mm. I'm not very social media savvy, but okay. I would think that would be the first step. Facebook, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, I get a lot of I have a lot of tuba Facebook mm. friends mm. and flutes as well. Mm. But whenever someone asks to be my friend, I accept a tuba player and then I send them a list of my tuba works. Mm. And, and that uh, it's one way to get your music out there. Now, if you wanted to do something, I know on Facebook, there are a lot of groups mm -hmm. and you can join a group. You can start a group. I'm not sure how you'd have to look it up. Um, they, I, I don't know anything about TikTok, but mm -hmm. I know that the kids, uh, my grandchildren, in fact, right now, they're just going back to school. And one of the things that they're doing is learning social media. Yep. So yeah. that, that would be a start, I would think. Yeah. Oh, for sure. But speaking specifically, like in your world, how do you bring people into your orbit? Because you said Ron does a very good job of it, and you yeah. are a shining example of it as well. I mean, look at how many pieces that you have put out, that have been performed, that have been produced, right? So are you just noticing that people, like in-person activities, like when somebody comes into your world, then you just ask, right? I mean, how does that conversation come up? Because I think a lot of times musicians are just stuck. They don't want to put themselves out there. They're afraid of rejection sometimes. And I'm just kind of curious, like what your process looks like. Well, um, I, when I was in Regina, that was a, that's a small city. Mm. So I, I knew all the musicians mm. and if I, and I started a few things. I started the contemporary directions ensemble way back when I first went there. Mm -hmm. And then later, uh, the um, Prairie Festival of New Music. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I could talk to people directly. I worked with the university. I worked with the Regina Symphony. So that wasn't so hard because I knew everyone personally. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I would do in Toronto. Uh, okay. I've been here 10 years. Um, however, I have a friend who started a group called the Untitled Ensemble, mm -hmm. which I can use uh, to, to demonstrate what she did. Mm -hmm. She wrote all of her friends who were musicians and said, I want to start this group. And she calls it untitled because it's, it's whatever is going to happen at the time. Mm. Different, different people playing uh, depends on the orchestration. She does try to keep it diverse, mm. you know, so that helps, especially it helps with grants. And she's mm. gotten several grants, which is nice. But during COVID, we had to play outside. She would put together a program and say, can you make this concert? And, uh, if we could, then, and she needed that instrumentation, mm -hmm. we did. For instance, I did a piece with her for uh, two of those, English horn and 
no, oboe, English horn, and piano. Mm. And whatever group could come together, we set up a rehearsal schedule and we did uh, put together the concert. She found places that we could play. Keep in mind, this is during the summer. Mm. Although it poured one time, we we went inside. We had the sound man out there. He had it quickly. Everybody grabbed yeah. something and ran inside. But uh, that she started that just by contacting everybody. Yep. And Reaching if you're out. interested, she had one meeting. She said, "If you're interested, come." And we did. Nice. Yeah. yeah. It can really that be would, that simple. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not sure how else you could do it other than yeah. these days with the internet, you, you can do anything. Oh, for sure. Yes. And it's really just me picking your brain just to showcase to people like using your story as a piece of encouragement, right? Yeah. Whether it's in person or virtual, look, it can happen if you, and you mentioned something earlier that you nailed it right on the head and you said, well, it was easier when I knew the people, right? Yeah. And so to me, what I'm hearing is you have to build those relationships. You if do. you have relationships in your life, then it's easy to scale it and to say, oh, let's actually do this together. And then projects yeah. are formed. You know, I thought I have another thought is if you live in a place like Toronto with all these universities, go to the mm-hmm. music departments. Yep. Just put a sign up on the thing and, and you know, get students. Because yeah. there are a lot of students would love to play. Oh, and and if you're you're um, uh, for finding places to play there, even if you can't get a, a full concert or a concert hall, there are a lot of churches that you can use. Mm-hmm. Old folks' homes, mm-hmm. they love it when you come mm-hmm. and play. We used to do that when I went to Eastman. We played in the senior citizens' homes. Okay. And they just loved it when we came. The, the sorority would put together a concert and go play. And it gave us the, the practice to play. Usually they had a piano in there. So that was something. The Regina Symphony, we used to play in senior citizens' homes there too. And they loved it. Oh, so smart. Yeah. yeah. Yes, what I'm hearing is be resourceful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. People oh want to hear you. People do yep. want to hear you if you can organize something. I love that. Yes. You know, another thing is my daughter and her, uh, the family, they all play. Mm. My daughter's a uh, top violinist and pianist. Her husband teaches composition at, at um, Western Ontario, University of Western Ontario. And in his youth played in a rock band. He played the <laughs> electric bass. Her two sons, she had triplets. Mm. And the, the, the twins, the two boys are top musicians at 12 years old but they they it's incredible hmm. how well they play and um and then the the two daughters uh the triplet daughter sings and the other daughter plays guitar and sings so they do porch concerts all summer because you know you couldn't do anything with covid yeah uh their the father is a um sound man that's one of the things he does. He produces CDs, among other things. He teaches that kind of thing at Western. So they have all this equipment and they, wow. they play on their porch. They pull everything out. They play. Uh, the one boy plays drums as well as keyboards. Mm-hmm. And, and they give these concerts and it, it's packed. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And, yeah. and actually during this period, a lot of other people were giving porch concerts. Mm, yes. And then you, you know, you either put out the hat if you want. They didn't do that, but a lot of people did, professional yeah. musicians. Yeah. There's a flutist out east, and her name is Mimi Stillman. And I saw her through Facebook do a lot of porch concerts. Yeah. 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 Very neat. So, as we are wrapping up this wonderful conversation, do you have any last sentiments that you would like to offer? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> let's get through this COVID thing. Yeah, there you but go. At the, at the same time, I, mm. I can't help thinking that it's opened up. You, you mm. know, it, it's a change. It's like, you know, when you go through your life and there's something you think, oh, my God, this is a disaster. How and somehow you come out of it and the other side stronger. Yeah. It's allowed you to make changes that you never would have bothered to make before. And I do feel like that uh, the COVID thing has changed so much. I am now watching the Toronto Symphony. I have one of those great big screens, you know, and I can um, I can cast from the, the computer down to the screen and they film it 
uh, they film these things and sometimes they do a green screen behind it, you know, so you have the the scene where they're playing. Mm. And that's something that you never would have had. I don't think it would have been kicked into action, but for the COVID. So there are some positive things that have come out of it. Oh, for sure. Yeah. From ashes comes beauty. Yeah. Yeah. The Phoenix. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, like for me, not to talk anyone's ear off, but, you know, my podcast, being able to talk with people from around the world and hearing their phenomenal stories. It's like, would I have had time to do that and to connect with musicians across the globe? Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? But yeah. I'm so glad it happened that way because now I have new friends like you, Elizabeth, and we can stay in touch and we can see where the relationship goes. And to me, that's a huge blessing. Oh, it is. It yeah. is for sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's another blessing is I can go to the Regina Symphony concerts now. Mm. They uh, stream them. Mm. So I couldn't go before. My friends would be playing mm. and I couldn't see it. Now mm. I can. Nice. Yeah, because they stream everything. Oh, how nice. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for your time and expertise. It's been wonderful getting to know you. And I cannot wait to listen to the CD Flute in the Wild that you were so generous to share with me. My pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to today's content. If you wouldn't mind sharing this episode or another episode through the Food360 podcast with one of your music friends, I would be so appreciative. Also, again, friendly reminder, the Ultimate Music Business Summit, or aka UMBS, is going down January 6th, 7th, and 8th of 2022. That's next weekend. Go to musicsummit.biz musicsummit.biz to claim your ticket now. I cannot wait to see you there. Thank you. Let's talk about flute.